It was supposed to be a groundbreaking achievement of spaceflight, a private sector-led return to our closest celestial neighbor in over 50 years. But on January the 8th, 2024, just hours after it blasted off from Earth's atmosphere, news broke that the Peregrine lunar lander would be anything but. America's first lunar lander since the Apollo program and private industry's first attempt to visit the moon would end in tragedy rather than triumph, with Peregrine and its payload set adrift in space. In today's astrographic special, we're going to explore the Peregrine's catastrophic mission failure, taking a closer look at just what this lander was and just how much work it got into it, and looking forward to the moment that humanity will finally set a lander down on the lunar surface again. Meet Peregrine. He's a stocky little guy, perhaps a slight bit round, and if he popped up on your Tinder feed, he certainly wouldn't be much to look at. Made predominantly of aluminium alloy and equipped with five thrusters, each capable of producing 150 pounds of thrust, Peregrine has the ability to carry just under 1,000 pounds or 450 kilograms of fuel, stand up on four legs, and deliver payloads of up to 584 pounds, that's 265 kilos, to his destination. He's got pretty good Wi-Fi, He's got insulators to keep himself and his loved ones, that is his payload, warm at night. And at a height of just under two meters or barely over six feet, he's not exactly small, but he's not too obtrusive at all. By all accounts, he's unremarkable, the sort of nice guy you'd take home to your parents, except for the part where he can travel to the moon. Peregrine is an invention by the American aerospace company Astrobotic, a private company that spent 17 years developing space robotics for missions both to the moon and to other planets. Founded by a name who would make for a fantastic Bond video, Dylan, Red Whitaker of Carnegie Mellon University, Astrobotic has been a favorite son of NASA for a number of years, receiving grants, partnerships, and more of that sort of thing, all with the hope that NASA can cultivate an asset that's capable of carrying out space missions in the private sector. Astrobotic aren't the only company in their current position, but they're part of a small handful that NASA hopes will be able to conduct space flights more affordably, with smaller teams, and with not quite so much vulnerability to the politics of Washington. For Astrobotic, Peregrine was to be the first bold step into the history books, the first lunar lander ever placed on the moon by a private organization, and the first, hopefully, of many that Astrobotic would send up in the coming years. Just as important as the Peregrine was the rocket it was expected to ride upon, the Vulcan. A two-stage heavy lift launch vehicle, the Centaur was not the brainchild of Astrobotic, but instead of United Launch Alliance, a joint venture between the space divisions of Lockheed Martin and Boeing. The United Launch Alliance, or ULA, exists to manufacture and operate rockets for orbital insertion both around the Earth and around other celestial bodies in our solar system, with their crowning achievements thus far being the Delta and Atlas launch vehicles. The Vulcan was intended to be the successor to both the Delta and the Atlas, and take part in both commercial launches and launches on behalf of the US Space Force and other national space agencies. The Vulcan is by all accounts, a bit of a hefty boy with a total mass of 546,700 kilograms, or 1.2 million pounds. At a height of 202 feet, or 61.6 .6 meters, and a diameter of 5.4 meters, or 18 feet, the Vulcan isn't quite on the scale of the Saturn V, but it's still pretty damn impressive, with the capacity to haul over 26,000 kilograms, or 60,000 pounds, into low Earth orbit, and put a little less than half of that amount into a trajectory to cross paths with the Moon. It could also be hooked up to a maximum of six booster rockets, although it didn't technically need any of them. Significantly, the Vulcan, until the launch of the Peregrine, had never taken a test flight and had never gotten any certifications to indicate that it could reliably perform its mission. The Peregrine's first flight would be the Vulcan's first too. And that was all the more important, because Peregrine wasn't just filled with placeholders or dummy items to weigh it down. The lander was equipped with a range of very real, very valuable payloads, some of them scientific, some of them not. Included on that list were six lunar rovers, a two kilogram, four and a half pound rover designed by students from Carnegie Mellon University, meant to test small rover mobility on the lunar surface, and five provided by the Mexican Space Agency, robots of less than 60 grams each that would be tossed onto the lunar surface. Those five tiny robots would be the first Latin American scientific instruments ever to reach the moon. NASA also paid big money to put a handful of other scientific instruments on Peregrine, a laser retroreflector array that was expected to track spacecraft in lunar orbit for decades to come, and a series of spectrometers and radiation detectors that would help NASA understand what humans would experience in the lunar environment. Astrobotic also intended to attach its terrain relative navigation sensor, which it claimed would allow a spacecraft to land on the lunar surface with an accuracy of less than 100 meters from pinpoints, which in lunar landing 
branding terms, is really, really good. Then there was all the non-scientific items on board, representing a range of nations and intentions. Germany sent a DHL moon box, a mementos box that included everything from songs to stickers to Dogecoin to a compilation of 133 written stories by a group called Writers on the Moon. Also included were Japan's Lunar Dream Capsule, which included messages from children across the globe, a digital library of archives from a company that curates information repositories meant to be scattered across the cosmos, and a physical coin from the Seychelles called BitMEX, loaded with one full single Bitcoin. Perhaps most unique among them, and also most controversial, were human remains provided by two space burial companies, Elysium and Celestis. 330 sets of human remains were carried on board in titanium capsules, measuring no larger than half an inch each or barely over a centimeter. 62 of them in turn would be deposited onto the moon. This came at the objection of the Native American Navajo Nation, as well as a range of non-Navajo experts and pundits, but the campaign to have the remains removed ultimately proved unsuccessful. Among their number were the symbolic remains of several U.S. presidents, including George Washington and John F. Kennedy, as well as several members of the cast of Star Trek, the creator of Star Trek, Gene Roddenberry, and his wife, Majel. Altogether, these 330 sets of remains, a dozen time capsules, a handful of instruments, six rovers, one lunar lander, and one heavy lift rocket would be making the ultimate journey, traversing the void until they finally reached the moon. In the deepest hours of the Florida night at 2.18 a.m. on January the 8th of this year, the Peregrine lunar lander took flight. It rode atop the back of the Vulcan Centaur rocket, a two-stage heavy lift launch vehicle produced by United Launch Alliance. The Vulcan Centaur 2 was taking its inaugural flight in what was meant to be a banner day for America's budding private spaceflight industry. The first moments of the launch were like any other, a burst of fire, a majestic early climb into the sky, and a trailing illumination that eventually climbed too high to see. At 1 minute 50 seconds into the launch, the rocket's solid boosters separated from the launch vehicle. At 4 minutes 59 seconds, the first stage of the launch vehicle stopped firing as planned. Seconds later, the first stage separated from the rest of the Vulcan rocket, which drifted, unpowered and quiet, toward the moon. At least it did for a couple of moments. Then the Vulcan's upper stage began its first burn as scheduled, firing for 10 minutes and placing the Peregrine lander into low Earth orbit. The pair coasted around the Earth for about an half hour, and then it was time to go. The Vulcan rocket fired for a second time, for a span of just three minutes, putting the Peregrine on its translunar injection trajectory, the course that would eventually see it meet with the moon, hundreds of thousands of miles away. The remaining portion of the Vulcan rocket fell away, and the Peregrine lander was on its own, hurtling into the void. But this is when the trouble started. After Peregrine powered itself up and made contact with mission control, the team on the ground prepared to take their lander through the next phases of what, to that point, had been a resounding success of a mission. The problem was, the crew on the ground realized before long that Peregrine was having a difficult time keeping its solar panels facing toward the sun. That power was critical to allow the lander to charge its battery, without which the rest of the mission would become very difficult if not impossible to complete. But try as they might, Mission Control couldn't keep the probe oriented in the right direction, suggesting that there was some sort of onboard problem with the propulsion system. The problem ended up being a fuel leak, which caused yet another problem. Now, not only was Peregrine unable to keep itself on track and simultaneously struggling with battery depletion, but even if it could get those two issues addressed, it lost so much fuel that a soft lunar landing, that is, one that would allow the lander to reach the lunar surface without crashing, was no longer possible. The astronautic mission control team was able to pull off an unspecified so-called improvised maneuver in order to reorient the solar array toward the sun, allowing the battery to recharge, but the fuel problem simply could not be addressed without anybody up in space to actually work on the problem. Before long, mission control had conceded that plan A was no longer going to be possible. Peregrine would never sit atop the lunar surface, no matter what else the team might have been able to salvage. But that wasn't the end for Astrobotic, and not by a long shot. There were still NASA instruments on board, the group still had its obligations to the many other entities who had placed their payloads on board, and there was still plenty of solar energy, if not propulsive fuel, to be able to steer the lander. If it wasn't going to be able to land, Peregrine was going to be able to send back pictures, confirming a disturbance that had warped the surface of his exterior, which was designed to be smooth. At that time, Mission Control believed that the Peregrine had as few as 40 hours left, and it kept on trying to stabilize itself, so they decided to make the most of those 40 hours to the extent that they could. Peregrine's ride to the moon turned into a mad dash, although mostly just in spirit, since trying to accelerate would have spent even more fuel than was already being lost. That fuel desperately needed to be conserved, because when it did inevitably run out, Peregrine would go into a tumble. Go into a tumble, and the solar panels would have zero chance of collecting any meaningful amount of energy. By the 55 hour mark of the mission, Peregrine was within spitting distance of the moon, over 80% of the way done with the trip. The initial plan had been to swing back around the Earth and then 
have Peregrine slingshot itself toward the actual moon so that they were at the same point in space at the same time. It was still possible to get near the moon, but with so little propellant left to keep Peregrine stable, it seemed increasingly unlikely that the lander's systems would be awake, so to speak, in order to see it. Mission Control did get some good news, specifically that the rate of the fuel leak was decreasing, but even with reduced propellant loss, it wouldn't be enough. And with that good news, the team got bad news too. The Peregrine's trajectory had changed due to complications following the fuel leak, and it was now on track to enter Earth's atmosphere, where it would be incinerated upon re-entry. After a couple of days of considering options, Astrobotic was forced to make a choice. There would be no triumphant end to the Peregrine mission, no desperate struggle to stretch its fuel supply far enough that it could intersect with the moon. After consultation with NASA, the global astrophysics community, and the US government, Mission Control made the decision to ensure that Peregrine's mission ended cleanly without leaving debris in the space between Earth and the moon, and without taking the chance that Peregrine could re-enter the Earth's orbit uncontrolled and end up hitting a functional satellite. The team would maintain the lander's trajectory, which was, at that time, on course to enter and then burn up in Earth's atmosphere. With it would go all its functional payloads, all the time capsules on board, and the human remains stored inside. All of it would be incinerated on the way back to Earth, leaving the way clear for future missions to make Peregrine's same journey without fear. Once the decision was made, the only thing left to do was to guide Peregrine back into Earth's orbit as safely and as predictably as possible. A re-entry site was chosen over a nearly empty swath of the South Pacific, and Mission Control nailed down their plan to adjust the re-entry course precisely, with a series of 23 short burns of Peregrine's remaining fuel to take it in. Peregrine came closer and closer and closer until finally the moment arrived. As one of its final acts, Peregrine beamed back a photo of Earth taken from its onboard camera at a distance of approximately 30,000 miles. From there, it traveled closer until on the evening of January the 18th, it re-entered Earth's atmosphere as scheduled and was consumed by fire. If anyone at all saw the re-entry, they were likely on Antium, the southernmost island of Onatu. Otherwise, it happens in a place too remote for humanity to see. Now, I've got to emphasize that just because Peregrine didn't get to the moon as anticipated, that doesn't mean the mission was anything close to a failure. In fact, it was very much the opposite. All of the lander payloads that had been intended to collect data were able to do so, and each of them proved their utility as an instrument for space travel. So too did the Vulcan rocket that ferried Peregrine into orbit prove that it was a resounding success. And after several earthly days spent in space, Peregrine proved that it was otherwise perfectly functional, with the only issue, of course, being the fuel leak. Its avionics, its hardware and software, and the system itself all functioned ideally, and while the decision was made to end its spaceflight prematurely for reasons other than the spacecraft's innate capabilities, it could very well have continued functioning for days or even weeks more. Now, don't get us wrong, this mission failure is an expensive one to the tune of well over $100 million in just NASA aid alone. But the proof of concept was irrefutably there. And we've also got to point out that even though Astrobotic did ultimately fail in its mission, the company also picked a damn tough mission to pull off. We simply must point out that even if humans have been doing them for a while, moon landings are still really hard. In 2023 alone, three nations attempted to put landers on the moon, and only one of them, India, was successful. Russia and a private company out of Japan were both unable to get it done, as was Israel back in 2019. Moon missions are expensive, they're an immense technical challenge, and they're difficult to replicate, meaning that anyone trying to put a lander on the moon's surface is likely not to have much practice and is likely to struggle to get enough funding for do-overs that they can justify treating a launch as anything other than a high-stakes one-time mission. Luckily for Astrobotic, we already know that Peregrine will not be your one-time only moonshot. They've already got a second lunar lander scheduled for launch named Griffin, and it'll blast off into space later this year. It's a medium-sized lander with a payload capacity beyond its own weight of 475 five kilograms or over a thousand pounds. It's built with options that should allow it to mount a wide variety of cargo. It can act as a home base for rovers, transport satellites, or other small lunar landers, or really anything else modern science can think to attach to it. It's built to be highly radiation tolerant, land autonomously with a high degree of precision, and serve as a home base for robotic exploration and prospecting missions. It'll deliver NASA's Viper probe to the lunar surface in November 2024, assuming that mission succeeds, with the ultimate goal being that Viper will be able to create a map of the moon's water ice for potential use as a resource in later moon missions. For Astro Astrobotic, Griffin offers the potential of a quick comeback after the bitter ending of the Peregrine program, and if the almost successful Peregrine is any indication, Griffin will be in good shape to perform its work so long as it's able to actually reach the moon. In terms of space exploration writ large, the Peregrine program's failure has been a notable, if not catastrophic, blow to the private space industry, and particularly to companies trying to land their own craft on the moon. 
Israeli and Japanese firms have already tried and failed. There's another company from the US that's set to make its own attempt in the next couple of months, and obviously Astrobotic has the Griffin lander to pivot toward. On the whole, Peregrine's saga is a message that commercial landings on the moon are still achievable, and really, they should seem well within reach. At the same time, they're also bloody difficult, and it goes to show why programs like Apollo ended up being so damn expensive. It's a lesson that rings all the truer as NASA continues its ongoing Artemis program, which has announced its own delays in recent weeks due to safety concerns, even as the Peregrine lander was beset by catastrophe. Whether Peregrine itself will be a world-shaking historical event or something more akin to a footnote, well, we suspect the latter. But in the span of a few short years that will bring major achievements in lunar exploration, Peregrine's is a story that can't be ignored. Without missions like this to pave the way, it becomes harder and harder for people to ever set foot on the moon again. But with Peregrine's sacrifice, we inch just a little bit closer to realizing that dream again.